Okay, you ready? Let's rock and roll. Well, you guys are good. I mean, you're spot on. Wow. You get the prize. Big, nice green apple. All right. Welcome back. So far, so good. You okay? Yes. Well, we're going to talk about a little more how to manage self-talk. It's probably been one of the worst mental diseases negative self-talk, being overly critical, obsessive, worrying. And I wonder, do we have any worriers in the room? I used to be CEO of your club, the Worriers Anonymous. And I say that now I'm only a member. And I say I'm still a member because, you know, it's just part of life's experience. It's hard sometimes not to. However, there are things we can do to counter those negative effects. So let's take a look at different ways. Let's take a look at our words, our language. Later, I'm going to put a recommended reading list out for you. And one of the books in there, there's several by Mark Robert Waldman and Dr. Andrew Newberg. And one of the most recent books is Words Can Change Your Brain. And it's interesting, our neuroscience is actually, so remember, we used to do what we call mental house cleaning. People say, oh, you're playing semantics. Oh, this is positive thinking. And the fact is, it's not semantics. That words influence us in more ways than we realize. Because why? The brain takes things at a subconscious level, literally. It's like your dream. When you're having a dream, it's just a thought in your subconscious mind. And that's why your whole body changes until you come into your conscious awareness and say, oh, no, it's just a dream. And then, of course, we, can, we, you know, we slow down. So this could be our best friend or our worst enemy. And what we really, part of the, one of the steps necessary in creating the life of our design is managing the self-talk. So what I want you to do right now is just think for a moment, how are you when you hear something? Someone's encouraging you, or they're talking about their goal, their aspiration, or a possibility, or maybe you're reading. Do you say, yeah, okay, or are you thinking of it? That's what I mean by this. So self-talk is not just the way we speak, it's also the attitude that accompanies our life's experiences. This morning, I got up at almost 5.30, sort of before, did my exercise, about 30 minutes of stretching, I went out for a walk in the rain with my hoodie and stuff. Wasn't that much better. I said, ah, it's raining. It's raining, but it's, it's good. And then I thought, excellent weather to be inside. Except now it's bright and sunny, <laughs> but muggy, hot. Good to be inside. So isn't it interesting when we experience life's life, how we breathe it? Winter here, we get tons of snow. Elementary students usually say, yes, keep snowing, baby. Snow for the rest of the winter. No more school, right? But for the people who have to go to work, rain, snow, sleet, or hail, and it's very dangerous, it can be very, very dangerous and treacherous driving in it here in the ice, but they still have to go you know, into work. But do they say, yes, I love it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Where I live here in Farmington, about two miles from here, and I'm flanked by two small working farms. And one of the farmers, he just retired from it, but for years and years, he plowed our driveway. And he would say when it was snowing, yes. And he was thrilled, even though it was really demanding sometimes. He said, I make more money plowing than I do as a farmer these days. It's interesting when you change your point of view, how you change your life. So what I want to move into is a little exercise, go through some details, and more importantly, you'll be able to do this while we're here, you know, while, while we're in the class. And it is, in the true sense of the word, a retraining of your language style, of your brain, because a lot of that being overly critical, the worry, is conditioned, is a conditioned response. Something's going on in our subconscious that causes us, and some people will overreact. Do you know the type? You know anybody like that? Not you, but maybe a friend of yours. Something happens and they say, oh my God, it's like the world's coming to an end. Yes? Yes. Um, I used to be one of those people, and I still have to watch, you know? One hand is good because you care. But on the other hand, if you get stressed out, 
you know, nothing gets done, right? So let's couple, play a game, a couple of um, quizzes, just for the fun of it, see what happens. You seem to be, well, obviously very, very good listeners. I know you're very intelligent. Some of this stuff might even be common sense. So let's just do a quick game, a word game. And here are the instructions, you ready? Listen close. Please, whatever you do, don't. And I mean don't. Think of monkeys in the back of the room, <laughs> eating bananas, and throwing them all over. Thank you, it was perfect, Michael. <laughs> okay, so who has an image of at least one monkey? <laughs> who, so bananas. So did you listen to me or what? <laughs> did you follow my directions? Tell me, yes or no? No. Actually, you could argue, yes. Was I effective in my communication of what I wanted? Altogether? No. no. Altogether? No. no. <clears throat> because I was focusing on what I didn't want. It's called the law of reverse success. And that word don't doesn't trigger. So if I say, don't slam the door, people slam. Don't slip on the ice. Don't forget to call me. The image is, as we speak, it's been called now recently as the holographic brain. As we speak, we're creating images, whether you realize it consciously or not. And as people listen, there's an interaction brain to brain, literally, which I'll explain more of later, which helps the learning. You're creating images. For some of you, it's very crisp and clear. For others, it's kind of faint, but it's still, it's how the brain works. And it's this back part of the brain controlling vision and eyesight. Eyesight is when we're looking at each other. Vision would be the mental imagery, the pictures, etc. So it'd be far more effective to say, do close the door gently. Do be careful out there. It's icy. Drive carefully. Do be early for our session. You ever watch sometimes on, on, on TV shows or uh, TV shows, they say, don't change that dial, don't go away. It's basic linguistics. Here's another one, ready? It's so good at this now, you'll figure this one out, you ready? Everybody, try to raise your right hand and arm. Try to raise your right hand and arm. Most everybody always alter it. If you want it to be literal, if I say try, that presupposes what? Try it. Yeah, look at that one. Maybe I will, maybe I will. It's doubtful. I mean, could you imagine if you were going in to the dentist's office or for surgery, and the dentist says, you're my first patient ever. <laughs> and I've never done this before. This is a new procedure. I've been looking at YouTube videos, learning how to do it. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I can do it. I'm gonna try my best for you. Do you think you would stay or you might say, see you later buddy, let me know when you have some experience. Isn't that great? That doesn't instill confidence. Yeah. So confidence is, is really important in trying. So often, I know we all do, try a new pair of shoes, new outfit, try you know, a new car out. It's, it's kind of integrated into our language. What really is more important to pay attention to is as we go to a new class, a new seminar, a new teacher, a new uh, stretching, maybe we're doing a new exercise or a new sports program or a new job or a new career, you get the idea? We need to be careful because if we're trying, we're putting a lot of resistance in. And that was the big lesson. Now when I look back, when I was in school, I was trying too hard. I mean, I was a, I was a Joe Books. I was studying and studying and studying. I probably I overdid it. I mean, really, I'm asking for help. And then I used to fall asleep in class, so then I borrowed my roommate's notes, and I'd fall asleep in his notes and drool all over it, and he wouldn't give them to me anymore. <laughs> I'm making a mess, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm sleep learning. You know, I got it. Come in there. I mean, that's when I was, you know, flunking out with that. So you have the idea. So these attitudes, yes, if you go back to the structure, our thoughts are the catalyst. So the words can be a trigger of thought. And the words we use in our communication are a reflection on our attitude. And that attitude affects our feelings because it causes the brain to release those neuropeptides. And that will affect our physiology.
So if you want to play a game or you go into a doctor's office or some of the banks have it or some stores, I used to see them a lot. Now I see them occasionally. And they're fun to play with. The blood pressure machine for free. You know, you pay, put your arm in, <laughs> squeezes the life out of your arm and takes your blood pressure. Get upset, get angry. Think of somebody you like to smack. No, you wouldn't want to smack it, but somebody you like to tickle. And watch your blood pressure before your eyes go out. And then allow for these slow, deep breaths. Think of something calming and see before your eyes. So the way you can have fun and test is called biofeedback, by the way. Feedback about what's going on in the body. And we hear words like can't. Sometimes people use that as an excuse. So when people go to a banker and they're looking for a loan or this or that, and they say, well, I really can't do that. If you know anything about their procedures and you know their position, you come to find out that they have every authority to do that. They just don't feel like doing the paperwork or whatever the reason might be. So sometimes people, or you invite somebody to a party or to a gathering or something important to you, I don't know, I'll try to be there and make a list. And people who say they're going to try are less likely to be there than those who say, I'll be there, you can count on me. The same thing with can't. It kind of closes the door. So an example I often like to use is flying a 747 jumbo jet across the Atlantic. If you were in that plane and the pilot passed out, and the co-pilot passed out, and the flight attendant said, you know, we're on autopilot, and they turned to you, turned to us, anybody here, we have any pilots here? We need your help, would you, you know? You'd say, where's the parachute, right? Are you joking? So I'm sure that, you, like myself, your first impression might be, I can't fly this sucker. But is it that technically you can't, or that you're yet to learn how to fly, and you haven't practiced for the hundreds of hours that it would take? There's a difference. And so that oftentimes, when there's something new we want to learn, it's a matter of having the right training, the skill, and then the practice. So things like can't. If you look in your book, in your manual, your resource book there, you'll find a discussion of this of 14. Technically, we don't need to have the books in the room. I like having them from the beginning, or at least referring, to teach you how to use them. So when you go home, the idea is for you to read this at home, not in the class. You can certainly take notes in your church to keep, make sure your name is you know, right there, and you guys should be getting it either later this afternoon or first thing in the morning. With that. But anyway, so, Anything that's really important, that's key, is written in here. If you look on 14, up on top in the, in the right hand margin, it says mental house cleaning. And you've got a nice discussion of belief systems on 15. And some of these words are there. So let me just put a sample of a, a few items in here. People go to a restaurant, new restaurant. How was it? Not bad. Not bad. It's an interesting point to hear that we put it in the greens of bad and find out pretty good. Okay. Really good. Exceptional. Get the idea? It's an invitation. Why? Again, I have to remind you this is important, this is essential because your thoughts are affecting your physiology and they're affecting your, your performance with that. Or people go, I just sent out a video that it's not my own video. It was a woman, uh, Mel Robbins, uh, from YouTube. And Barbara, my wife, turned me on to her. I hadn't seen it. She was featured in um, Success Magazine. Did you see? That's really good stuff, huh? I saw that, and I said, I've got to share this with, with people in our community. And she made this funny comment. Hi, how are you? Fine. Fine? Really? Just fine? And she did this whole thing about just fine? What about outstanding, excellent? Or tell the truth, maybe you're lousy. But we all have this defense mechanism. So I say someone's really hurting inside, but especially if it's a good friend. I'm not talking about strangers, because strangers, you know, they say, hi, how are you, and they keep walking. I don't even answer anymore. I'm serious, because they, people, it's just like a reflex. Hi, how are you? How you doing? But they keep walking. With that. So when you're with a friend, especially, but she made this point about telling the truth. Why is that important? I understand it, I want you to, if we're not telling the truth, we create dissonance, we create friction, we create upset inside, 
because you know deep inside how you really are. And the first step in getting better, the first step of solving a problem or solution is to acknowledge the way things are. Doesn't mean we're stuck there, but then we know what to work with, you know, we know what we're dealing with. There's just something about that. It's, 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 it's liberating, it's, it's kind of a releasing, if you will. So I put up on the board, purposely not so bright, point of view, three possible viewpoints. So tell me, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, these are three possible strategies. So the first one is drawn to this, and I have it in yellow so you can see it, because I don't want to put too much energy into it. Some people always anticipate the worst, and they will tell you, I always expect the worst because I don't want to be disappointed. So can we do a, a, a quick quiz game? Thank you. Could you pass that on to my children? <laughs> Nick Nelly, you're, you're going to get the star. Who would like to be disappointed today? Who would like a good, healthy, big, fat disappointment? <laughs> no, there's something I'm being ridiculous. It's an early flip. Nobody in their right mind wants to be disappointed. And disappointments can be upsetting. Agree? can be a real letdown. It can really rock lack of confidence and can cause us to give up. So can you see how in our lives, sometimes, and some people are very skillful, not expecting too much, not having big goals, not dreaming, because they don't want to be disappointed. Now I hear some individuals, some of you are familiar with them, say, dream big. And we all need to dream big. I agree to an extent. Because a lot of that's motivation people are dreaming out of their comfort zone, out of their skill level, it can be very frustrating. It's important to build it step by step by step, having a big picture, so that you're building the confidence you know, with, with, with respect to that. So this certainly doesn't seem practical, this jaundiced point of view, it's not gonna get us anywhere. So then we have a, just the opposite, the rosy-eyed viewpoint. <laughs> Life is great, everything's perfect. When I did silver, we were accused of it being the Pollyanna approach. Ah, I'm an alpha. <laughs> By the way, I'm, I'm making fun, but that really was a lot of the sentiment in the early 70s. We had a lot of, um, of the fringe element. And there are many articles, like in Life Magazine, there's like 500 articles written about silver throughout our history. And, uh, and it was a very positive article and then I think it was very misleading. It's called Flow Gently Sweet Alpha. And you're gonna learn how to do that. Have a problem, just enter your alpha state. You'll never have a problem again. Give me a freaking break. If that were true, we'd all be sleeping. Because every time we go to sleep, we go into this alpha state. We also go, you know, the different sleep states. <coughs> and it's very natural for the brain during the day to daydream. The key is being able to do something with it, being able to sustain it, which is what we're here for. So that doesn't seem to be, I mean, it's kind of nice. Do you know anybody like that in your life? They're just overly optimistic. It's kind of contagious, isn't it? Just like the negativity can be. I'm not knocking it, it's just, you need kind of a healthy balance. So what I'm gonna to recommend to you, this is my point of view, a positive realist. Be optimistic, be hopeful. And the realist says, now what skills will I need? What resources will I need to bring this dream reality, and then we need to take some action and do something. So I don't mean we shouldn't dream big, I mean we need to recognize if this is what we want, then what's it going to take to get there? And it's not going to happen because you know, we're nice people and we're sitting, uh, you know, if you saw the movie The Secret, if, you, if you're familiar with this work, you probably love the movie. It was very well done. Incredible Hollywood production. There were more people who were upset by the movie than people who were turned on. There was a huge backlash. There were some people who weren't into the practice and didn't quite understand what to do. It seemed far-fetched. It seemed oversimplified. And people felt less than because, how come I ever be able to do that? And how come I have you know, this, this debilitating disease and this woman over here saying she just meditated and the disease went away? Because she didn't say all the things she did in, to get to that point. So positive realism. So anyway, mental health cleaning. What we're looking at is, yes, our language, and 
more importantly, the, the behind it. So he just put on the board that some of these may be in your book of 14, some of the words are not, which we did, can't, try. To things like miscommunication, such as never, always. How, who in here has had a conversation with somebody and they say something like, you never listen. <laughs> Honey, you gotta be at least once in my life. I listened to the preacher when he asked me if I do, and I said I do. <laughs> I know that it sounds silly, but really, it's true. So I guess I did listen at least once. So if somebody's telling you you never listen, that's going to cause defensiveness, and that's going to cause something. Nobody wants to hear that. And if we say you're always late, and they can close the door. And I can tell you, I'm talking to psychology, advanced psychology, and neuroscience. If we talk like that to people, they'll get defensive and they won't listen. So you could say, I think you missed it. I think this time you weren't listening to me. That's a very different thing than saying you never listen, or you're always late. This time you were late, or you had a tendency in the past to frequently be late. It's a little softer. I know sometimes it seems like they always are. What we're looking for is good communication and connecting, and so that we have harmony rather than conflict. The word, but. Come on, some of this common sense. One of the guys who I'm happy to quote would be this guy, Brendan Bouchard, who's all over the internet. And he said, it's common sense, but it's not always common practice. I love that expression. It's so true. So much you and I know, but we don't actually do it. And that's what, what we're here for, is to put into practice you know, these things. So that word, but. Think of how many times you've had a conversation with somebody, and they're going on, and they're telling you, oh, you're so wonderful, this is so great, and you're waiting for the what? Exactly. But. And the but closes the doors. So if you would like to close the door in a business meeting, in a conversation with your teacher, with a dear friend, and you stop saying, yes, but, all the research shows, they'll put up a defensive wall. Nobody wants to hear that. It's like negating everything they said. Far more effective to say something like, yes, I hear what you're saying, and I'd like to add this, or I'd like to add my point of view. So that's respecting also the other person's point of view, or more likely to have a harmonious communication rather than conflict. You get the idea? Yeah. All right. I mean, we could go on and on. I don't want to belabor it. But what's more important and essential is to look at the attitude behind the words and how we greet life and things that come up. So if you're feeling tacked, something comes up and very challenged, are you saying, I'm up for it, okay, let's go? Or are you saying, oh, crap, I think I should just quit. Or I'm taking too much on. That's what you want to watch for. So the expression is, is um, hope. Hope is a driving force. Hope is what gets us up in the morning. Hope is what motivates us. It's the promise of something more, something better. And I'm not talking wishful thinking something better, but hey, I'm taking action. I'm studying. And because of that, and I'm preparing, I'm going to do a good job. It's the, it's some of us can talk about stage fright. If ever you have to give a speech, or a talk, or a presentation, the best way to counter stage fright is prepare and practice. Because if you're prepared, then you say, I've been practicing, I've prepared, I know what to do, just gotta let it roll. I'll do that. A couple of others, just a few more things. The idea is to focus on what you want and not the opposite. So the expression is, whatever you give attention to, you give energy to. And whatever we give energy to will tend to grow and multiply. So if I say, don't think of the monkeys in the back, we're giving attention to the monkeys that are in the back of the room. Don't think of the siren that just went by outside, and it brings all of our attention out there. So words like hate. I know sometimes that seems like that with people or situations. The concern is that word hate, for the past, at least four decades in the life sciences, now neuroscience, it's been demonstrated. It's a very, 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 very powerful word to 
can have an effect that elicits all sorts of chemicals and toxins in the body and can throw up your digestion, can create ten anxiety in the body, and can cause the body to become acidic. And the acid balance, it's important to have an acid pH balance. So how can we tell the truth that instead of like this intense, I hate my life, I hate, ooh, I dislike it. I dislike it intensely, to dislike, so we're softening it. So it's not so that bad. So I'm telling you, Dr. Man, it's really that important. Same thing with tired. Go in here and know somebody and say, hey, how are you? I'm tired. Oh, really? What's that? I'm so tired. I'm tired. Oh, I'm so exhausted. I'm tired. I'm so tired. <coughs> I'm working on my 24-year-old daughter with that. She's in a doctorate program, and it is very demanding. And I don't take away from that, you know. And she, plus, she works, and she does really good. So, I said maybe it might help if instead of staying up to one o'clock and getting up early, you might go to bed a little earlier and get, you know, more sleep, and you won't be so tired because you do need seven to eight hours sleep. And if you're get, not getting that, you're going to feel the need of a rest. It's, it's that simple um, with that. So, how can we say I need a rest? I need a break. I need to recharge my battery. I need to get some more um, positive energy, etc. The next one, should, I should. Anybody here find that you fall asleep way too early? You know, at night when you go to bed, like you have trouble staying awake at night? Oh, I no. <laughs> You're a good sleeper. If you have trouble that you're falling asleep too easily and you'd like to stay awake longer, just should on yourself. Meaning you're in bed and just think of everything you should have done today. Everything you should have done in your life. And tell me how you feel. You feel like stressed. You feel like a loser. You don't feel so hot. So one of the things we're going to start looking at is give yourself permission not to be perfect. Hey, I made a mistake. Man, I really made a big mistake. I'm going to do better next time. And that's part of what we hear. We're learning how to correct things. So it's important to give ourselves permission not to be perfect. And the last, just as a sample, is pain in the neck. Um, I have three brothers and sisters. I'm the baby. And I have it the easiest, I admit. The two of them, my sister is 15 years older, my brother is 14 years older than me. My other sister is four years older. Those two grew up together. My other sister were closer. We grew up together, you know, for, for the most part. And we're very close. And she used to frequently say to me, Ah, oh, Ken, you're such a pain in the butt. In a loving way, with, I mean, that, with, with, with a smile on her face. Because, you know, she's complaining about gaining weight. And I'm saying, well, maybe if you didn't eat that, or you manage this, or manage that, you know, things would be different. Oh, you're such a pain in the butt. And you're so disciplined. You eat so properly, and you do all this exercise, and so on. So one day, she gave me, I was in big pain, I took her for a day. So I was just goofing, my silly humor. I said, hey, Matt, how are you feeling back there anyway? How's your butt? I thought she would get the message and go, oh, you know. But instead, she got real serious and said, you know, it's funny you should ask. I've been feeling this in my lower back, and she started telling me about her aches and pains. <laughs> and it was a reminder to me to pay attention. When people experience disappointments or upset in their lives, how do they handle it? It's called the point of power. Everybody has challenges. Everybody goes through stuff. Just in this past less than a year, we've had two deaths in our family, two fathers, aunts. They were 96 and 90, whatever, five up there, but it's still a loss within two weeks of each other. Challenges with her brother, serious, serious challenges with all you know, all that, and caring. Things that you know, are on our mind, we all have that, right? Mm -hmm. But the point of power is what we do with it, how we handle it. So whether it becomes debilitating, or whether we you know, kind of work through it, and sure it's taxing, you know, is, is the message there. So this idea of the pain, uh, it's a reminder, we can say it's difficult, it's challenging, it's hard to listen to when you talk like that. Again, get the idea? All right, now that you get the idea, so good. And even though you know this, do you think it's going to go away just because you agree? No. What do you think? All together? No. no. What we mean by retraining is we have a habit of speaking a certain way. It's not going to take much, but it is going to take being aware of it and catching yourself. 
So anytime while we're here together, anytime you're home on your own, if you have a negative or worrisome thought, it's called a pattern interruption in psychology. And what that means is so that we don't feed the pattern, because we're very much creatures of habit, and we go on autopilot. We want to do something to immediately nip it in the bud. And it's an expression taken from the original computer programming skills before we had digital. We would rewind the tape and type in cancel. Rewind it again, cancel. And that was like the delete or the escape with that different term that we had. So I'd like you to say it out loud. Everybody out loud, cancel, cancel. Cancel, cancel. This is the antidote to skill. Say it again. Cancel, cancel. One more time. Cancel, cancel. Doesn't that sound ridiculous? Cancel, cancel. I think it's absurd. Just can you imagine a husband and wife or a good friend having a discussion? Oh, you're being negative. Cancel, cancel. No, no, cancel, cancel you. No, no, cancel you. <laughs> that's not what it's meant, and that's not real communication, and I think you know better. So if you're thinking that's Barbara and I at home, you know, <laughs> cancel, cancel. Of course not. What it's meant to be, it's an awareness exercise to call our attention to we're being negative, and it stops from, you know, because whatever we give attention to, we give energy to, and whatever we give energy to will grow, so it's a way to stop giving energy to it. Can't, it's so absurd, that's why it works. It's so ridiculous, that's why it works. So it's meant to be private. Some of you who have parents or friends who took silver before you may have heard them from time to time say, cancel, cancel. And my reminder is, if people don't know where you're coming from, out of context, it sounds like you're canceling me out. <laughs> that's not what's meant by it. So you, you can do it privately in your head. When we're with each other, though, we can help each other that if we're being negative, it's a way to bring to my attention. I'm giving a presentation in New York City, and I kept making a point, a really important point. I said, this is critical. Then, and I repeat, this is critical. And the instructor said, cancel, cancel, and who was sponsoring me. I said, what do you mean? This is critical. And then when we talked about it, I said, gee, what kind of emotions are elicited when you think about something being critical? Or he's got issues. When somebody tells you he's got issues, do you feel warm and fuzzy? You know, I think like, wow, good for him. <laughs> Challenges, opportunities to grow, projects. So now I say, this is vitally important. So when you hear me say something vitally important, I replace vitally with, so cancel, cancel to stop it, and then you replace it, something you're gonna say instead of, and now that's become habitual and lasts. This used to be the secret handshake, it's the initiation into the silver program. Mm -hmm. If you're walking, right? Somebody says, oh. I, I'm at BU school, and someone I knew you know, casually at school, I'm walking up the stairs, concrete outside of Calm Avenue, and he's going down, hey Ken, how's it going? And I'm going up, he's going down, and say, hey, it's better and better, yeah. out loud. And he turned, pivoted, and looked, and he said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear. <laughs> I said, what? So sorry. He says, yeah, I'm sorry. You must have been sicker and sicker if you're better and better. <laughs> we used to get more fun with that expression. Listen now. The good news is, guys, so much of this work has become mainstream. So much of this work has been researched in the evidence. Because, listen, I hear this expression come up constantly. And they're not necessarily graduates. It used to be like a secret handshake if I met this gentleman, hey, so how's this thing? And I said, better and better. Silva? Yeah. And we've known each other from silver. Now that's not necessarily true. It actually comes from the Okuwe, but how does that sound? So maybe things are not so good and they're kind of you know hurting. Better and better means somehow, some way, I'm gonna learn to get out of this now. Somehow, some way I'm gonna turn it around. Or maybe you're feeling this, like Wonder Woman, and you're feeling you know, really super. There's always room to grow and to learn. One of my biggest pet peeves in this field is when people tell me, been there, done that. And they remind me of how many PhDs and how many books they've read, and I know this. I know you do. Are you using it? Have you integrated it in your life? So intellectualism is what academia pretty much 
pushes, so we're talking about making it a lifestyle, integrated where you're walking the talk. People who know me, I'm happy to say, recognize, I live this principle. I'm in the trenches with you. I walk the talk. And that's not necessarily true for a lot of people in personal development, for some guests, you can tell. So better and better. I have to show you a picture. This is very cool, and I love it when it happens. Some years ago, a, a young woman named Savannah Ray Shiva, about five years ago, approximately, I have to check, you know, time's flying. But I know it was definitely after 2008, sometime. Anyway, she had a great presence with me in the class, and she told me her story. As a young girl at the age of 12, she was having seizures, epileptic-like seizures. And she was, they couldn't control them at first, and it looked like she was gonna die. And then the neurologist came up with some medication and saved her life, and she's been on medication, and now she's in her early 30s, almost. A long stretch. When I met her, this was just before she turned 30, she had, it's been many years, she went into seizures again. It had been a long time, and the drugs, meds were not working anymore. She's in the hospital, in the intensive care unit, and they didn't know what to do. It's like one after the other after the other. And finally, they were able to control her and stop and kind of stabilize her and again save her life. A young man who she just started dating, and they're both musicians, they were just forming a band together, turned her on to Silva. And he took some of the meditation that was on, on CDs and told her about it. She ate it up, loved it, and started doing it every day like you're going to learn here. And in the last, she's been seizure-free since then, and no drugs, no meds. And by the way, I'm not your doctor, and I don't pretend to be a physician, and I'm even hesitant to say that because I would never recommend that. Always work under the supervision of the doctor. But her neurologist is freaking out. But he's watching her closely to make sure. And she's like this image of health. They got the band going. She's also an aspiring actress and an aspiring silver instructor. And I'm a little bit disappointed because she's getting so many gigs as an actress, filling in. They just filmed up in, in North, just north of here, Northampton, with Josh Brolin a few years ago, and um, Kate Blanchett, I think it was. And she was the body double. So she's getting parts like that. but. And other things, more and more, you know, gracing her presence. So anyway, they were living on Cape Cod. They moved to Connecticut. They're just east, on the other side of the Connecticut River, it's a town called East Hawkins, and there's Manchester. And her and Sean are driving in the car. They make a right turn, and they're on a main road. And as they make the turn, this is what was directly in front of them. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Better than woman. What is so they said, oh, wow, we got to send this to Ken. So you can see oh, the, the windshield wiper. They took a photo, oh, sent it to me, texted it. <laughs> and, and then I said, well, wait a minute. I guess I never told you the story. I know these people. No they way. are still around. Wow. Yes. No way. When I moved here, I was in Boston. I moved here in 74. And Pat and Doc Cormier, they're in East Hall. I think they both passed away. And their children run the business. Pat was a pl plumber, built up the business. When he went through silver, I think he took it even before me, he adopted better and better plumbing as his business name. People said, what the heck is that? He said, I do a better job for a better price. <laughs> he told me that throughout all the recession since the 70s, even though business was up and down, his business was very stable and growing. I didn't know they had it on their trucks. I've had them in my home to do some work. You know, I haven't seen them in a while. So I thought that was the coolest thing. Wow. And they didn't know that, so I just had to share that. What an interesting attitude to have. Better job for better price. So let's play a game. 